guest today is one of the founders and owner of Float On, a six-float tank center in Portland, Oregon, as well as an original host of the Float Conference. He has a deep knowledge of floating history, best practices, psychological benefits, and really just a positive outlook on life. I had a great time talking with this guy. Here is my friend, Graham Talley. How do you even get into the business of floating human beings? Yeah, yeah. So uh, I guess, first of all, floating in this case is sensory deprivation tanks is what they used to be called. Now they're called float tanks. Um, Sometimes the practice is called flotation therapy. And uh, yeah, how do you get into it? You, uh, uh, well, my path has been a pretty uh, curvy one, I guess, throughout my entire life. Uh, So it was absolutely nothing specific that led me into floating, but kind of the combination of a bunch of things that came beforehand. And essentially, my good friend, uh, Quinn, had uh, just quit a pretty uh, well-paying job. Uh, he was kind of like tech support escalation for uh, for a big company. I won't say the name of it, but, uh, you know, the kind of thing like when uh, terrible things happen, you've already gotten escalated through three levels of customer support. He's the, ones who would ta- or the one who would take those <sighs> high-level calls. So very miserable. He'd gotten out of that. He had a decent amount of money and was trying to figure out the next thing to do with his life. And uh, he's the one who introduced me to uh, floating. And he had uh, he had called me up one day and was talking about how he'd uh, he'd been uh, he'd just gotten for his first float and he went for like a three hour float. I didn't even know he was going to be in that long and got out and it'd been three hours. And uh, he got out and he's just like, yeah, I think I need to call my parents <laughs> and talk to them. And I was just like, man, anything that can make him that sensitive and just have thought that much about his life, I'm I'm into it. So I started looking into it. My background is in experimental psychology. Uh, so when I found floating, the first thing I started delving into was the actual science articles on it and what it's all about. And that's kind of what actually led into a deeper interest and ultimately led me from just kind of spitballing back of the envelope things with Quinn, trying to figure out what a float tank business might look like if he wanted to start one into actually then becoming an active partner and kind of helping push it forward. Wow. So do you know much about the history of it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So when did people actually, when did anybody figure out that you could... I, I was thinking about this when you were on the way over here. There's that um, that uh, sea or lake or whatever somewhere over the Dead Sea. It, the yeah. Dead Sea, okay, and it's super high uh, sodium or salt concentrate, so people float naturally. Did that? Is that where it began? Yeah, so that's, I mean, certainly a practice of floating. And there's there's been other instances of this kind of idea. I mean, even to a lesser extent, just the ocean is even a little more buoyant than regular water um, for its small amount of salt content than it has. And uh, to give you an idea, yeah, so the float tanks are pretty much as buoyant as the Dead Sea. Uh, they're around 30% salt concentration by volume, like any more salt, and it would start turning into a solid and just actually have salt crystals floating there on top of the Hmm. water, which the Dead Sea does at parts of it. So I guess there are parts of the Dead Sea that are even saltier than than the float tanks. So that concept, certainly, and for the Dead Sea, that's kind of a uh, almost ritual, is to go out there and and float in the Dead Sea for certain groups. And for floating, it came around in the 1950s. So 1954 was kind of like the first float tank. And back then, they were totally different. Than, and you got to go in and, and try it out at our center um, just recently, right? Did I see that you'd made an appointment? I did. Yeah. 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 And we'll talk about that later. Yeah, yeah. But, we'll get to that for sure. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, very different than, than the float tanks that, that you hopped into. And basically, it was... Uh, so Dr. John C. Lilly is the inventor of the float tanks. Uh, interesting guy, if you guys have never heard of uh, John C. Lilly, someone who's worth looking into. And uh, kind of one of the premier scientists back in the day. But there was this question going around of what happens when you cut off all sensory stimulation to a human being? Like what happens, because what, we're kind of input devices, right? Uh, and sure. you know, we like analyzation of that input. So what happens when you're just not getting any input? And some people thought that you'd just go to sleep, like without input coming in, you'd kind of like pass out almost. Some people thought that you'd, uh, you know, go crazy <laughs> and like not come you back could. from it. Yeah. Um, you get, like, for, I don't think anyone treated this one seriously, but there were even theories you just die. You know, no inputs coming in. That's it. You like your brain, can't, your nervous system can't handle it, you know. Um, so John C. Lilly was on that track and trying to figure out what does happen when there's no stimulation coming in. Uh, there's also some interesting government programs. So this is all during the time that he was with the National Institute of Health, so the NIH. And he ended up finding a big, uh, literal like tank, like a water tank in, uh, kind of this warehouse that wasn't being used and ended up, uh, taking that over. 
And so the original float tanks had a full breathing mask uh, that you'd put on, and it was done in fresh water. And then you had a little safety man observer. I can shoot along some graphics afterwards. You okay. can put them in the show notes because um, yeah. they're pretty funny, the early diagrams. But yeah, a little safety man observer uh, who would make sure that the oxygen going into the mask was still going, the person was breathing, could get them out if something went wrong. And you just literally submerged yourself with a, He actually made a bunch of different models of masks to try and find something that was comfortable and you couldn't really feel on your skin and blocked out all light. So they kind of look like weird Halloween <laughs> horror costumes because <laughs> yeah. there's no eye holes, you know? It's just like a tube coming out and... Uh, yeah, and you'd, you'd submerge yourself in there. And the idea was to keep your all the water at skin temperature um, because that's one of the hardest things to control is just temperature across your body. And water ends up being a great medium to be able to accomplish that. So all the water is at skin temperature neutral is what it's called, a little cooler than your external um, or than your internal body temperature, I mean. So internal is like around 98.6. External temperature is around like 93 and a half degrees which is around the water temperature that we keep all the float tanks. Okay. So fully submerged, got this creepy mask on, and, uh, and you just float there. And so he was, he kind of came from this school of thought and scientists that if you're going to experiment on human subjects, you should be the first subject, if at all possible. So he was the first one to really go into this totally light-deprived, neutral, buoyant uh, temperature environment. And what, what, what were his notes? What did he experience? Was, did he find what he was looking for? He like tripped balls. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. He, uh, and he's kind of a sensitive guy when it comes to that, which is its own crazy stories about John Lilly. But yeah, he pretty much came out and felt like he just had the best massage of his life and also just had full on hallucinations while he was in the float tank. Wow. And blew his mind. And then that led to, you know, another couple decades of basically using largely that tank on and off, bringing some guests in, um, doing stuff under the auspices of NIH. Eventually, he published a, a book called Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer, uh, which we actually uh, worked with John Lilly's estate to re-release after um, 25 years of being Damn. out of print, which is really cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, so he wrote that on the, the experience, which is an interesting book. Pretty much he wrote it for... Uh, his thesis, and as a result, the uh, the language is so dense. It's like tw the introduction is like twenty six pages of just like really hoping that it bores anyone from reading the rest of it. And then he goes on to talk about float tanks, LSD, <laughs> dolphin intelligence, like all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah. At that point, had he ever done psychedelics? Um, at the point that he wrote that book, he had okay, um, but not with the uh, initial float tank, at least publicly stated. Uh, kind of his uh, first psychedelic experience with LSD uh, with the float tank was like right before they broke it down uh, yeah. pretty much and, and dismantled the original one that he that he had. Um, but he did uh, a little late in the game for some of the, you know, at the time Sando's LSD in the, the um, 50s going into the 60s was kind of going around in this academic sphere. And so a little bit he was late to the game for scientists who were starting to experiment with it. I wonder what the... What Late the, to the game, but, you know, like five, ten years or something like that. Yeah. yeah. I wonder what the thought process was for people who had heard what he was saying, because there's always been this push to keep people from doing mind-altering things. So I wonder if there was pushback on him for him finding something natural that could produce this state. I wonder if... Did they try to stop him from doing it? Not from doing the floating, but it was kind of done a little bit underground back in the day. And then he started after he kind of left that, he started doing workshops and building um, his own little custom float tanks outside of that. And then slowly developed to what floating is today, which I guess I'll just like, as long as we're going to talk about this for probably a while in the podcast, I'll actually give a little description of what the heck floating yeah, do it. even is today. So from that kind of fully submerged spot, again, with the goal of eliminating all senses, you end up going to... Um, uh, they started pumping salt water, or I guess before that even, you had fresh water, but kind of a lay down style tank that we have now. So rather than being fully submerged, uh, your body's kind of cut in half by the water, your ears are below the water. And with fresh water, you had to bend your knees and then kind of take what's called dolphin breath. So you'd like fill in your air or your lungs with air and go, and then hold it. And then when you exhale, you go, hmm. uh, that's so your torso doesn't sink into the water, right? Well, yeah, it seems like that would take too much mental effort. Yeah, almost like a breathing meditation in addition to being in this kind of watery environment. And then they started piping salt water into the tanks, uh, which gave it a little more buoyancy. And then from there, they, they took it to saturation with sodium chloride, which ended up being terrible for your skin and any cuts <laughs> stung and stuff like that. Yeah. And then from there, you moved on to using magnesium sulfate or Epsom salt, which is what we use in the float tanks now. And that's kind of getting into the 1970s. So in 1973, 
1974 is like the first commercial float tank gets produced by Gwen and Lee Perry with Samadhi Float Tank Company, um, kind of in conjunction with John Lilly. Um, really cool pioneers of the, the float tank world as well. And they release uh, their first float tank. They start a giant float center down in uh, Beverly Hills and uh, use that as a vehicle to also sell their float tanks. And so you kind of get this first float tank boom of the 80s. And at this point, what float tanks look like now is sort of a uh, box that's about four and a half feet wide, eight feet long. Um, uh, if you kind of cut the corner off of one of the, uh, of, off of a just like big cardboard box, you kind of mm-hmm. get the idea. Um, so there's like one flat plane. Again, I'll send along some photos for your show notes. Okay. And a little door that you open up, climb inside. There's only about 11 inches of water in there. So about 200 gallons worth of uh, solution. And then about a thousand pounds of Epsom salt mixed in with that. Per float? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so you don't end up, yeah. So per, per, in every float tank, there's about a thousand pounds of Epsom salt in there. Yeah. Yeah, but it gets flushed out how often? Um, so all of the water gets like extremely cleaned between every person. So it goes through like three to four volumetric turnovers through a big UV light filter and um, all of the But you're saying stuff. you go through 1,100 pounds of salt every float? No, no, no. So so the water gets cycled. Um, actually, so we, we top off the tanks every week with a certain amount of salt. Okay. And then about once every six months um, to a year, depending on the float center, they're okay. replacing all the salt. I was going to say, dude, generally. that's a lot of salt. No, you couldn't. You couldn't. It actually, it takes about like 18 hours just to get it up to temperature. Wow. Because um, when you add salt to dissolve or water to salt to dissolve it, it's an endothermic reaction. So that method of dissolving sucks out all the heat. Like you can pour, you can hold a pile of Epsom salt on your hand and pour boiling water over the top of it. And by the time it reaches the bottom, it'll be cold as it dissolves the salt, which takes out the heat. Yeah. So just getting that much salt up to temperature takes 18 hours. Yeah. There's literally no way you could Whoa. do that. So instead we rely on just really rigorous, thorough cleaning in between every person. Okay. Um, yeah. So like, uh, kind of like a swimming pool on steroids mm-hmm. is sort of our, our filtration system that we toss everything through. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's laid down, um, again, about four and a half feet wide by eight feet long. And all the water is again, at that skin receptor neutral temperature of about 93 and a half degrees. Uh, the rooms themselves end up being really soundproof. Some of the burden of float tanks isn't actually the tank itself. It's the room design around it. So we end up doing really extensive soundproofing um, in most float tank centers just to make sure no sound is getting into the room. It's sort of like a, a mix between like a, uh, you have to design a totally like waterproof sauna room plus a sound studio. If you can imagine that is kind of what a float tank room is. So you lay down in there, water's at skin temperature. Even just the lack of gravity is kind of awesome. Um, your spine decompresses, your muscles relax. A lot of people describe it like a massage without getting touched. And then uh, when you turn off the lights on the inside, there's no light, no sound, no sense of touch, and pretty much no gravity on your body. And you just float there. And sessions typically last anywhere from like 60 to 90 minutes, I would say, is the the average length. Some places do shorter, like 30-minute floats. Some places like us do also longer late-night floats, like two and a half hours. Uh, The longest float we've hosted has been 24 hours at our center. Seems like you get all pruney and dehydrated. No, yeah, you actually don't even prune. You might not have noticed this, but yeah, you don't prune up in the float tank at all because the salt. Yeah, the density somehow hmm. doesn't allow that pruning effect to happen. Hmm. Um, yeah, our guess is that there's not like kind of this osmotic exchange of water, but I don't know. I'm not sure actually exactly what uh, what causes it. But yeah, you don't prune up at all inside the float tank. Hmm. Um, and if you you know, a lot of people just use Epsom salt for soaking their feet, you know, soaking in the elbow if it's injured or something like that. So if you can picture being in like basically a giant uh, soak of, yeah, one thing, like your entire body is basically soaking in, in Epsom salt. In fact, I think you come out feeling really nice for your, your skin. Your skin actually kind of does feel a little, little silky and mm-hmm. soft afterwards too. Sure. Yeah. Wow. I was not expecting you to know that much about the history. That's great, man. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So he, <laughs> so with John Lilly, Oh, it's a, he's Correct. his own crazy person. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've gone on book tours just talking about him. Like, he's he's wild. Yeah, we actually, when we released um, uh, Programming and Metaprogramming, got it to be uh, uh, kind of at the top of some of the Amazon bestseller lists. So, nice. Yeah, it ended up being a, a fun project for that, too. Nice. So he, he creates this in 1954. Uh, he does the regular fresh water for how many years before he figures out Epsom salt? Um, so, I mean, before Epsom salt, we'll say, I mean... Let's see. So 54 to 74. So I mean, a minimum of like 10 to 15 years, probably before it kind of like started developing into the model that it is now. Mm -hmm. But a lot of that, again, is just in this super, uh, you know, prototype kind of tank that he's found at National Institute of Health, where he's running mostly personal experiments with himself. Yeah, it's it's not like Frisbee 
you can't just go to the park with a piece of plastic. Like, it's a serious deal. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. So then it really starts to catch on in the 80s, is what you said. Yeah? Yeah, so it kind of goes through this big boom, right? So it, it uh, Glenn and Lee Perry from Samadhi Float Tank Company released the first commercial float tank. That starts taking off. The first research starts happening. How much um, was the first float tank you could purchase personally? Oh, boy, I'd have to look that one up. I can't remember how much it was. Um, the, the very first float tank was actually made out of a, a very sturdy cardboard. Really? Which is interesting, yeah, huh. with a liner on the inside. And huh. it's because the uh, evaporation from the water on the inside would actually pass through the cardboard. So as long as you didn't set anything on top of it, all the moisture could actually go in and go out without damaging it. So it was like this, uh, not not like a cardboard box like you'd think of, but like a really sturdy cardboard. So yeah, the first commercial float tanks were actually made out of cardboard. Um, and then from there, it turned into um, like an ABS plastic kind of material. And then some fiberglassers started coming around. More manufacturers started springing up both in the U.S. and over in the U.K. Um, you had your yeah, first, uh, first science being done out of uh, um, Toledo, Ohio with uh, John Fine and, uh, or Tom Fine and John Turner, kind of like the original uh, float researchers outside of John Lilly. And they start releasing a bunch of stuff on stress and cortisol levels and floating. And that starts getting some attention. Uh, and then the, uh, you start getting more and more float centers opening up. There's people who are using this commercially. Um, you see places open kind of across the United States. Um, people like, uh, um, you know, Timothy Leary are getting their own personal float tanks. Um, people like, uh, um, Robin Williams are starting to float, uh, Susan Sarandon, getting all of these like articles coming out in big, prominent magazines. And then the AIDS pandemic hits. And pretty much overnight, if you talk to float center owners from uh, from back in that day, it goes from like there's this rising tide and like they seem to be everywhere. And kind of like right now, there's a lot of floating in the media. It's like this huge surge of, of awareness from this thing that no one knew anything about to it becoming popular. And then overnight again, it just drops off and no one's floating. Because people thought they were going to get AIDS from the water? Yeah, I mean, people were afraid to shake hands yeah. back then. And the swimming pool industry, the hot tub industry, they could they were big enough that they kind of were, like, they took huge hits. But they were able to survive this, this kind of dip. And the float tank industry being so new and so weird just kind of crashed <laughs> overnight. And, uh, and it's not like now, too. Like, I actually, like, so that happened. And then I kind of credit it to a little bit, like, we have the internet now. And now we have the, like, so something gets released in Omni magazine, let's say, and there's a giant article about floating that builds all of, like, all of this awareness and people get excited. But then AIDS hits and there's the AIDS scare. Like, you can't just, like, if you're talking to someone about floating, you can't just pull out your phone and be like, no, look, it's legit. Here's all, <laughs> yeah. the, here's all this science on it. You yeah. know, like, unless you have a copy of Omni in your back pocket, like, you can't actually prove it to people. And now it's like you can research stuff. You can find out things so much faster in the face of misinformation in a mm -hmm. lot of senses about what's contagious and what's not. And that was not, the, I mean, like in a different world, the the pandemic that just happened could have absolutely in the same way wiped out the float tank industry. But yeah, it didn't this time around, fortunately. Yeah, I hear what you're saying for sure. I mean, it took, it took a while for people to realize that, I mean, AIDS is a horrible disease and you don't want to get it, obviously, even though there's medication for it now. But yeah, for at least a decade, people were terrified of it. Yeah, yeah, and certainly right. I mean, again, for anything that's that new and just un, unproven in a certain sense, that, those were the first things that really got hit hard. And then it really took until about 2010, like here in the U.S., for things to start to bounce back for what I'd call kind of like almost the second wave of, of floating coming around. So, yeah, the, the, the AIDS pandemic pretty much like killed <laughs> floating for, yeah, a decade and a half, a couple decades. So when did float on open? 2010. 2010. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right at the beginning of that. Yeah. Um, so when we opened, there was probably only about, you know, less than 100, maybe like 60 places to float across the country. And a lot of those were just in someone's apartment, um, you know, attached to a spa or something like that. Portland's one of the places that actually had uh, common grounds here in town, which ran hot tubs. Um, there's two common grounds, uh, not to be confused. Common grounds Everett House is the one that had float tanks for any of you Portlanders listening. But uh yeah, they were some of the ones that actually were running it through the 90s, too, and kind of like carried on that that torch a little bit through that that time period. Um, so we opened with four tanks. Now we have six at our, our float on location here in Portland. And um, yeah, when we opened with four tanks, we were tied for the biggest in the country. Serious. Yeah, there were like three other people who had four tanks and like that was it. Yeah, other than that. Yeah, just yeah, one, two, occasional three tank operations, but what, very small. What were the first couple years like? 
I mean, did you have a bunch of people coming in or was it kind of slow? No, we, we were slammed from the second we opened. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, yeah. We were booked out for like two weeks solid. Um, yeah, pretty much from the time we opened and then quickly expanded to, yeah, being open 24 hours a day. Um, so yeah, and then, then we de-expanded to being open to run floats 22 hours a day because <laughs> it turns out you need two hours of like deep cleaning the rooms and just to get salts out of weird corners that you can't just in the normal in between transitions and stuff. So yeah, for pretty much until, uh, until 2020, we were running 22 hours a day of floats and then expanded from four to six tanks. Wow. So yeah, very, very kind of popular from the beginning. And the location that's down there, it's on 45th and Hawthorne, mm -hmm. right? What was that building when you bought it? Uh, so, uh, well, first of all, we don't own the building. We're just renting it. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, the, the shop we moved into was a speaker headphone shop when we first moved in. And then we expanded and added on two other tanks. Um, we took over a shop that had just vacated. Um, uh, Portland Classic, actually. They, they just moved a couple blocks up. But George's Shoe Repair. Shout out to George. <laughs> Um, he's been on Hawthorne for ever. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, they, uh, the rent went a little too expensive for them. So they moved a couple blocks down and we took over the shop right next to us and built out these two extra tanks. Yeah. I'm just curious because like you said, the construction process and what you have to do to each room is insane. Yeah. Yeah. And we did everything wrong at the beginning too. Like we had no, like, we were the idiots who were just like, ah, we'll slap some float tanks into rooms. Like surely <laughs> this will work out fine. And yeah. like, yeah, of our original construction that we did for our first four tank center, I think there's like this much of a wall that's still left. <laughs> like that's it. Other than that, we've torn it all out and replaced it. We've gone through like four sets of floors for our different float tank rooms, trying to find stuff that isn't destroyed by salt. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy business. So it's the salt, not the water that ruins things. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I usually, uh, so we do a bunch of trainings for new float tank centers starting up and stuff like that. But yeah, I usually tell people like salt destroys everything. Like it'll destroy your walls, your floors, your favorite shoes, your sanity your relationships. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah, just it literally, it's a killer. Yeah, it'll destroy yeah. everything. Yeah, we could go into the mechanics of salt damage, which are interesting if you want to, but... Well, yeah, I mean, that's why all the cars on coast get messed up, right? Yep. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, also where it's like nowhere safe because they also salt roads, right? Yeah. So you, you're, yeah, if, if you need to live somewhere not near the coast that doesn't snow yeah. and then your car is safe. Yeah. <laughs> but no, same, same basic idea. Only Epsom salt's even worse, it turns out, than regular salt, yeah. And what's the difference between Epsom salt and regular salt again? Um, so just different chemical compounds. Okay. Yep. So uh, Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. Um, technically, we use magnesium sulfate heptahydrate, so MgSO4, 7H2O. But, uh, and then, you know, uh, regular table salt is sodium chloride, so NaCl. Can you eat Epsom salt? Um, you can. It's actually used in some medical purposes, but in large amounts, it, uh, yeah. Uh, it Not is, good. Uh, yeah. Uh, very good for your, your gut health if you're constipated or something like that. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So then you guys buy the place in 2010, you start putting things in. And so obviously the, the water is an issue. The floors are an issue. The salt is an issue. What about sound? Because I ha I have a background in studio recording. That's sure. what I went to school yeah. for. And at one point, I thought I was going to build a studio at my house. And I, even with my knowledge from going to school, I thought I could do it. And then I bought a book about how to build a legit sound proof room. And it's insane. Oh, yeah. yeah what no, you, it's crazy. What you're supposed to do to make it right requires so many different steps and uh, extra insul insulation and special types of glue. Uh, so did you guys, when you built it the first time, did you realize that or did you have to redo the rooms to make them soundproof? Oh no, we had to redo like, yeah, everything. <laughs> um, I mean, we did realize it would take soundproofing. We just weren't experts. And it turns out a lot of contractors will promise a lot of things that they're experts and they're not, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, that's one good good lesson uh, from all of this is to not just take people at their face value for what they say sometimes, well, yeah, especially contractors. But um, Well, yeah, I guess if you were building something that there were only 60 of in the United States, you were kind of blazing the trail, man. A little bit, yeah. And fortunately, I mean, to, like shout outs to everyone in the float community. We try to carry this forward as, as much as we possibly can, but we would not have even been able to even like get open in the first place if it weren't for all of the amazing support and free advice that people gave us. You know, even talking to Glenn and Lee Perry, who I talked about developing the first commercial float tanks, like 
we had this electrical problem with one of our float tanks. We were calling around trying to figure it out to other float tank centers. And Glenn Perry just like calls my cell phone and is like, we're having a trouble with like an electric current in one of our float tanks. And he calls up and he says, I hear you're having a shocking problem. <laughs> and I'm like, what? Glenn Perry? And he's like the one walking me through it, right? He's like the dude who invented the first float tanks to begin with. Nice. Um, so yeah, so much. And they never asked for like a penny for, for any of that stuff, you know? Mm. So yeah, it's a very, I think because everything is so challenging, with things like the soundproofing, with the waterproofing, uh, that it's like there's this camaraderie or like brother in arms kind of mentality in the industry of mm -hmm. like everyone, I call it trial by water, <laughs> you know, but like people have just had to go through so much crap in order to actually get open and then maintain their float tank centers. There's this huge culture of sharing information, helping each other, uh, just kind of, you know, making it easier for the next person to open up and, and spread floating around too. But no, you're right. Yeah. So we do double stud walls. We use like, yeah, full quiet rock things taken up to the roof, not the, just the ceiling. We do basically a full room within a room set up and then for the floor this is gonna you have to be a sound expert to like nerd out this quick on things i'm happy to explain it but um <laughs> on the floor instead of doing a full kind of false floor or anything like that we do um vibration isolation pads um under the tank on a platform uh so that's like takes care of the floor side and then everything else is basically yeah full room within a room set up in our two big open pools that we have in there actually we have a full suspended drywall ceiling as well to complete the top part okay what if there's a dude outside with a jackhammer uh, I mean, you can hear, especially vibration is really hard. Um, it's kind of an interesting little, I'll just throw out like little biology factoids as we go through this too. But uh, just, we wouldn't even have to soundproof the rooms if we didn't have a middle ear, uh, which is kind of interesting. So just having your ears below the water blocks out so much noise huh. um, that's going in. But our middle ear is freaking phenomenal at hearing in water. And so as a result, like, yeah, anything that turns into vibration in the water, um, we're actually surprisingly good at hearing underwater hmm. for being these weird land-born mammalian creatures, you know? Um, so yeah, jackhammers, um, even like a really loud, most trucks driving by outside, you can't hear it all inside the tank. And honestly, most people won't hear it. I have really sensitive hearing, had you turned down the, the headphones <laughs> beforehand. But um, like, I can hear when a really loud motorcycle or like a really loud truck goes by, but only barely. It'll be like, oh. You know, so yeah, jackhammering, you could totally hear if someone was like, yeah, driving a pylon into the ground to construct a, you know, big condo building that would make its way in mm -hmm. and probably wouldn't do a sound studio too, to be honest. So yeah, yeah, yeah. there's only so much you can do. Anyway, I could nerd out on soundproofing forever. Apologies. Yeah. It's like, we need to give little disclaimers when we go into too technical <laughs> territory or something, because I can go like deep into some of this stuff, but yeah, I've pretty much become an expert in soundproofing through this entire process. It's which fascinating. Is yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't think people realize what is necessary for, for some of that stuff just to record some of your favorite music. I mean, you can't do it in an apartment in the middle of the city, you know? You got to have a legit place that uh, is, is well insulated and taken care of. So, yeah, for that situation, which, so, yeah, I, I went and did it last night. I didn't. Oh, I didn't realize you did it so closely. That's great. No, I, I'm glad you got in so uh, so close to the interview. That's yeah, great. I didn't intend for it to happen that way, but uh, you graciously gave me a, a float, and I because I hadn't done it before, I wanted to make sure I did it before I talked to you, just so I had some sort of reference to whatever it was, whether I liked it or whether I didn't like it or whatever. I just wanted to be able to uh, relay information based on my experience of it and, you know, compare it to yours. And it was super busy, busy the last couple of weeks. So I couldn't get in until last night, but yeah. So going in there, it is for whatever reason, I was kind of intimidated. I don't know why. And I was talking to myself about it. I'm like, dude, you're just going to lay in a pool of water why are you freaking out about this? And I got there and the guy that helped me, he was super cool, explained everything to me. And, you know, to reiterate what you said, there's 11 inches of water. And I was in, I think I was in room four. Okay, big, big white tank. Yeah, it was It was probably like, you could probably fit like two or three people in that yeah, space. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess you wouldn't want to. I mean, yeah, we just do solo floats. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah, and so you go in there and you get naked and then you you hose down, you know, get all the, the excess stuff off you. And then you get in there and there's this little circular kind of like a Frisbee thing that the guy that helped me, he told me, he's like, yeah, I always just put my head on that, you know, as you lay back and then maybe it'll float away as you're, you're getting into it. And when I laid down in there, there was something I had read 
uh, either like in the email that you guys send out, that's like, relax your, your neck. Don't tense up your neck, you know, just kind of let it do what it's going to do. And my ears wouldn't go under the water. Like I didn't want to let them do it. And so for the first 10 or 15 minutes, like it wasn't comfortable at all. And I couldn't quite figure out what I was supposed to be doing. And I was almost going to give up. And I was like, what the fuck, man? You can't give up. You got to go through it and see <laughs> what it's like. And so I kept just talking to myself. And then finally, once I laid my head back in and you get your ears under the water, then that's when I realized like, that's what you got to do. And once you get in that state, I, I told this to the guy when I left, I was like, you need to, you need to practice it. You need to do it a few times to get good at it. I imagine it's like any sort of hobby or skill or anything. Cause I feel like I got close, but I didn't experience what you probably have doing it a hundred thousand times. But once you get in there and you're laying back and your ears are underneath the water, it just feels like you're, it feels like you're laying on a cloud. You forget that you have arms, you forget you have legs, <laughs> and you're just like, you are you, your, your entity, your soul, your whatever, you're just like floating in space. The lights are off, you can't see anything, and that is also a little disorienting at first because I'm not really afraid of much, like I'm pretty, pretty chill, but being in that space, it just feels a little different, and it takes a second to get yourself used to it. And then once you get into it, it's, it's really cool. And you forget, you forget that you're a person, you know, you, um, I kept thinking, I don't know what time it is. I don't know how long this, is. you know, I know it's 90 minutes. I don't know when the music music's going to come on to tell me to stop. Then I would think about, oh, I got to do this thing tomorrow. I got to pick up my kids. I got to, what am I going to eat for lunch? Like, all these thoughts that are constantly going through your mind, I guess it's similar to meditation. You have to shut them off so that you can just lay there and be, and then you can like ease into it, man. Yeah, I usually call it like training wheels for meditation <laughs> almost, you know, like all of that, like rid your mind of the outside world stuff. The float tank kind of takes care of that for you. You know, it's cutting out all of your outside senses. You're pretty comfortable laying in there. Um, but no, I mean, if any float's going to be weird, um, you know, we usually call the first float kind of a, a getting used to the tank float, right? You're in this new salty like environment. You're waiting for something to happen. You don't really know what it is for sure. And then some people are just born floaters and within like the first float, they're just in it, you know? Um, but yeah, often there, there's almost like a saying in the float industry that, you know, if you uh, want to get into it, even just floating three times is good and who knows whether it'll be the first float or the third float but i think for most people within three floats they're kind of going a little deeper into it and kind of finding that place of of calm and, and here's a like little cheat hack too for 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 it which is just schedule floats really close to each other like if you really want to get into it i would say like if you schedule three floats within a week or like three floats within a five-day period that's really by the third time you're just so like your body's so much used to that environment Right. Uh, as opposed to the first time, again, you're you're bobbing up and down like we're really used to being compressed at nine point eight meters per second squared, you know, being in this gravity environment. And yeah, just getting a chance to play with that and then, yeah, have times where you go in and it feels comfortable. You drop in so much faster. Plus, it just naturally relaxes your brain and body so much. I think by the third time, you're just like, ah, you know. Yeah, I, I can see how it would get a lot easier to, because you get in there and you're in that 93 degree, I don't know what you have the rooms at, but the rooms are nice and warm too. And then you get in the water and everything just feels normal. Like it feels like yeah. what it should be. And then in the, in the pool I was in, like it was big enough, like I said, for like three or four people, but it was just me and I'm laying in there and you can't feel any of the walls. You're just, you're floating in space. And as soon as somehow I would like go to touch a wall, I'd be like, whoa, what is that thing? I don't want that, you know, but I, I was in there for, I didn't do all 90 minutes. I did about an hour, hour and 10. You chill in the same spot. I don't understand how you don't move. You're just right there. I, I touched the wall once or twice. Mm, nice. That's pretty good for a first time, honestly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Not, you're, you're yeah, born natural. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got to go back and do it again for sure. It was, it was cool, man. Um, I have done a lot of psychedelics and I was searching for that aspect of it, or at least the ability to like shut off your brain and just see kind of what happens. 
and I kind of went into a dream state. And it was, it was like a glimpse, you know, it was like just getting there. And then I kind of came back a little bit and I was like, no, 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 I want to go there. And so I kept trying to, to get it. And that's why I think I need a few more to really figure it out. Yeah, for sure. And honestly, like the, we usually try to really underemphasize the the psychedelic aspects. Like it kind of led in with John Lilly and his first float just being this, you know, even in this crazy, weird, full water uh, tank being this crazy psychedelic experience, you know. But uh, yeah, it, it's so random almost the people who uh, have that. Like I usually, uh, we uh, at some point early on, we actually found this uh, auditory visual hallucination index that's like a psychological scale you can give to people to see how likely they are almost to just be susceptible to like audio or visual hallucinations in their daily life. And everyone who was like in our staff and owners who had really intense, much more visual, almost along those lines of, of like a... Um, I won't quite say psychedelic, but more psychedelic experience in the float tanks. Uh, yeah, tested really highly on that auditory visual hallucination skill, scale. And then people like me and my partner, Ashkan, tested really low. And for me, I almost never get visuals in the float tanks. Uh, but then sometimes I do, you know, and sometimes I, I do have these almost really trippy floats. So, you know, I usually tell people floating differs not only uh, person to person like that, but even float to float. And it's really, the tank is really good at giving you what you need at any given point, but it, not what you want or what you expect from it, you know? And um, yeah, just to, uh, to to kind of follow up on that, this is this is years of floating experience, this sagac sagacity coming down here, but um, the, uh, like this float tank's just some weird device that holds water and you sit in, right? The cool thing is what the human body can do. That's what I've realized over a decade of, of running floats is that our body's amazing. Like when you float, I mean, there's studies you heal faster, there's like more injury prevention because you're more conscious of parts of your body that are tight that you shouldn't work out as much. There's like better create. They've studied like jazz improvisationists and they're rated as more creative along like a bunch of different scales with their <laughs> improvisation. And even personally, I've seen people get off of heroin floating um, as like pretty much their only treatment for it. I've seen people lose like a bunch of weight and just stop smoking, stop drinking alcohol while they're floating is kind of one of their main psychological treatments. And if you start describing this to too many people outright, it almost sounds like you're selling snake oil <laughs> or yeah. something like that, right? It's like, oh, cool, help me do my taxes, you know? It's like, <laughs> yes, it will. Like, you're stressed out when you're doing your taxes. Hop in a float tank, yeah. you know? But, like, the the cool thing, and I think lots of times the way that even float tank center owners talk about that is this is the benefits that the float tank provide. And the cool thing is you're just removing the outside world. Like, we forget how stressed out we are as human beings, right? Like, we're walking around balancing on two pillars for legs like that alone takes such a huge cognitive burden when we detect any temperature at all we're controlling for our temperature and what our body is doing in response to that are you shivering are you like get the instinct to move around a little more to warm up are you like slowing down because you're hot right turns out when you're at neutral temperature all of those signals don't even go to your brain huh. you're not like even interpreting it as neutral temperature like the signals just turn off and that's true for so much, right? We exist in this world of blinking lights and hurtling giant metal objects going by us that we need to take into account and trying to be on podcasts and not embarrass ourselves, right? Like there's this huge <laughs> cognitive load. And it's cool that when you take that away, the human body is able to do so many amazing things that it wants to, like, that's how our body wants to be. It's the world and our environment that prevents us from being in that kind of just amazing state where our body's taking care of us. But yeah, that's really what I've like one of the big things I've learned from floating is just like how amazing my own body and this biological mechanism truly is. Yeah. Yeah, because your body is the vessel for your mind and they work together and you, you have to take care of your mind. You have to take care of your body so that they can both function together. And for me... I like to think it's a, a positive thing, but it's probably not. I base a lot of my life on productivity. Hmm. And I have a very difficult, yeah. For some reason, it sounds like people are walking on the roof sometimes. I don't know what's up with that. <laughs> they probably are. Yeah, it's probably fine. <laughs> it's totally cool. Uh, but <laughs> a lot of my life is I have a list of things I need to do. And the list never goes away. And or it gets bigger. It, or it gets bigger. And I have a difficult time just, say, on a Sunday, just sitting in my sweatpants and watching TV or doing nothing. 
Like I could edit something. I could work on a project at my house. I could go run. I could go clean my car. Like there's a hundred million things I could do. And I have trouble shutting all that off and just doing nothing because I feel better about myself if I achieve things. And so as I'm driving to your shop yesterday, I'm thinking about all this, this is fucked up. I'm thinking about all the stuff that I can't do because I'm going to spend 90 minutes floating. And then I go, you're looking at this wrong, man. <laughs> this is a break for you. And my mind is running. My mind is thinking about all this stuff I have to do. And yep. I get there and I get in the tank. And then that's when I realize, like, that is really important to be able to just take a break from all the stuff you're supposed to do because your mind doesn't want to think about that stuff all the time. I mean, I guess that's probably a big... Uh, uh, a big reason that sleep is so important is because you just get to stop. And so when you go in the tank like that, I think that's what was so cool. It took me 15, 20 minutes to get rid of everything. But once I got in there, it's so relaxing. It's so relieving to stop thinking about everything. Yeah, we don't, we don't do it enough. I mean, my, like, so I gave the example of, I think usually it takes people to get like, take three floats to kind of get into it. I don't know if you can tell by my word per minute count, but my brain is constantly going. Like it probably took, like if I hadn't read the scientific articles on floating, I would have just given up on it well before I, I actually had kind of my own, not even breakthrough experience, just before I even got really physically for myself what it was about. Like I think it was about like my 13th float where I was finally able to relax into it. So like I have this overactive productivity kind of mindset and yeah, again, a brain that's always going with its own internal narrative and uh, I, and I think it's, especially for people like us, uh, super important to take that time out. You know, there's a saying in, um, meditation that if you don't have time to meditate for an hour, you should probably meditate for two. <laughs> right. And I use that in floating too. It's like, Hey, if you don't have time to float for an hour and a half, maybe you should float for three hours, you know? So how often do you go? Um, I like to get in at least once or twice a week. Um, I think recently it's been a little bit less. I've been doing some uh, traveling and, and stuff like that. So at minimum, I'm usually in there once every two to three weeks. Uh, but yeah, I, I even feel it when I, I'm going in less than once a week or less than once every other week. Um, I mean, in my body, too. I mean, it's so good for actually just like <laughs> relaxing your, your body and muscles. And I'm at a computer so much, you know, at this point, I'm not working the shop. So it's a lot of admin computer phone call kind of stuff that I'm doing throughout the day and man yeah I like absolutely feel it in my muscles when I'm like doing stretches and yoga and stuff in the morning if I'm not hopping in a float tank regularly for sure yeah it's so crazy that that's where we're at now I don't know what the percentage is but people majority people sit at a desk like this Staring at a screen. Yeah, typing. with worse posture than that, too. Yeah, yeah no, you're, you're no. doing like the ideal example of someone yeah. sitting at a desk right now. <laughs> yeah, no, it's not good for your body. And I mean, unfortunately, it's kind of necessary if you want a job because, I mean, that's kind of what you got to do. But, I mean, exercise is so important and giving your body that break. And the other thing I thought of is it, it's got to be similar to being in space, right? Because you're not you're not using your muscle. That's the other thing I thought is like, maybe if you did it for too long, would your muscles atrophy? And then you like, you try to get out and nothing's like working. And maybe if you were in the environment, literally the entire time nonstop for like several months, <laughs> which is never going to happen. Like, so no, you couldn't, you couldn't actually float enough, like in, in the day to day life, I think to cause problems. Yeah. Pretty much the only difference though, I think is our inner ear is really good at detecting gravity. Um, and that's the one thing we can't really eliminate in the float tank is like we at any point do have uh, a very keen sense of which direction is gravitationally down, huh. uh, thanks to yeah, little mechanics on our, our inner ear. So, uh, something that John Lilly wrote about, and there are even some float tanks that have played around with Faraday cages and stuff like that built into them so that you can actually stop the, um, electromagnetic fields from getting in as well, uh, which is pretty cool. So yeah, really trying to block out as many senses as possible. How much would it cost to do that to your place? <laughs> um, that's a good question. I mean, less than you'd think. The Faraday really? cage is basically a fine metal mesh. Okay. Yeah, that just takes up the charge and incorporates it into its own little uh, huh. structure. Yeah, so building a, a Faraday cage is, uh, yeah, maybe a little simpler than some people 
think it to be. And that would allow you to not understand which way gravity is. No, no, no. Sorry. That's the electromagnetic field. So that's like the, uh, yeah, like, you know, there's heaters and float tanks, there's electronics around. If you want to block like all kind of electromagnetic field signals coming in, right? Like from the cell phone nearby or whatever. Okay. You kind of need a little Faraday cage around. No, the inner ear you can't get rid of. That's what you need space for. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But yeah, other than that, I mean, a lot of people do kind of call floating the closest thing that you can experience to outer space without actually leaving the planet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, I wonder, I mean, when NASA prepares those guys, they go in a swimming pool, don't they? Yeah, I got to, uh, yeah, check. I uh, heard a talk from the guy who manages that. Um, As a result of all this, uh, my business partner and I have started going around giving talks to uh, water sanitation conferences, basically, for the last, like, eight years or something. Uh, But yeah, so the dude who actually maintains all the chlorine levels and stuff in the giant, like, mini stories deep uh, swimming pool that NASA uses, uh, got to see a little presentation by him on that. But yeah, they have a full model of the space station out there underwater that they go in spacesuits underwater and have, like, scuba divers around monitoring. But yeah, that that environment is so similar to space. It's, like, kind of the, the closest we can get. But yeah, maintaining the neutral buoyancy becomes a little difficult. Yeah. That'd be so cool. I'd love to do that. I'd love to go through NASA training. I'd love to do the G-force uh, thing where they spin you around. Uh-huh. I'd love to do basic training in the army. Just like all these different things, just so, to test yourself and see if you could do it. So what is it that excites you about that like act of doing those things that like it causes a little bit of, uh, we'll say like apprehension almost for something like going into floating. Or I imagine like if you were just like doing a silent meditative retreat for for, like four days, that would almost be, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it seems like that would almost be like more of a uh, nervous kind of experience than trying to like go into NASA training or do something much more active like that, you know? I guess I'm just curious in understanding experiences because you can read about stuff, but you never really know unless you do it. Very true. Yeah. Um. I don't know. I think it's just, I I think I've lived most of my life trying to figure out what it's like to do something. And I mean, sometimes it's not what you think it is. Often. Yeah. I'd say like almost always. (laughs) In fact, like the, the act is so much different than what you've conceived. Yeah. Well, yeah. Dude, the thing that bums me out is that, uh, when I was a kid, when there'd be some band coming through town, I would get tickets and I would think about it for months. And now, I mean, anybody could get me a ticket or I could get a ticket or so, to to see fucking John Lennon. And yeah, I'd be like, yeah. oh, cool. And then like the day would come, <laughs> I'd go see him. There, He'd play two songs. I'd be like, okay, cool. When are we going to go back home? You know? The older you get, like you just can't stay excited about stuff. Uh, but I think there's a part of me that even though that may be the case about something like concerts, If there is something that I haven't done before, maybe it's not excitement. Maybe it's just like to prove to myself that I can do it. I don't know. I don't know. I just think, I think it's important to try stuff that you're scared of. I think it's important to push yourself because otherwise you're just 80 years old, chilling on your couch and you're like, oh man, I wish I... I got a free float from Graham. I wish I would have went and done that (laughs) back in 2022. Yeah. Why would I not do it, you know? Um, Yeah, I don't know. Life is weird. I mean, yeah, I'm into that. Life is very weird. I will say, like, I think that, so uh, I'm far from an expert in the realm of uh, traditional meditation. Uh, You know, I have my own meditative practices. Uh, You know, I've looked into a few different types of meditation and, and tried it out. But, you know, those worlds go deep. Some of them have uh, very distinct religious or, uh, you know, different kind of affiliations. But I will say there's this concept in there of uh, the uh, like everything that we do in this uh, interacting with the world is, in a sense, all illusion. Right. And I think that there's some cognitive like neuroscience backing to that as well, which is that, yeah, I mean, even at the very simple level, which a lot of philosophers have explored. Right. We only really uh, know the outside world through our perception, right? Like there's the classic, hey, we could just be a brain in a bag somewhere and we're just experiencing all of these signals and the outside world doesn't exist, right? I believe it does. That's fine. We don't need to go into that. But at the very least, it's all mediated through our sensory experience. And so that idea of being still 
and almost being able to get that same thrill of doing new things or exploration simply by going uh, inward rather than outward with your attention, I do think is something that's worthwhile to explore for, for anyone, you mm-hmm. know, and to make it just like you'd exercise or try to do yoga, you know, and you're not great. I, like there's a lot of meditators out there who want to meditate every day and they end up meditating once a week or whatever. But just like you'd strive to have these balancing practices for your body, I think it's really uh, worthwhile, again, to explore that idea of exploration uh, inward. And you said you're a, you're a big psychonaut as well. Um, I mean, so that that very much fits into, I think, that that same kind of framework, I'd say. Well, there's so much we don't understand about so many things. But one of the, one of the things you think we would understand more would be the human mind. But you also... You can only understand so much because there's 8 billion different perspectives. You can't understand what everyone is thinking. You only know your experience. And so you go into the tank and you eliminate all the input. There's no light. There's no sound. You can't feel your arms. You're just floating there. You're all inside here. And then that's when... That's when some cool stuff can happen if you're willing to allow it to happen. And that, I mean, that, that's what happens on drugs too, you know? So, I mean, I don't, I don't mean to make them synonymous if that's something that the float tank industry doesn't want it to be, but. Yeah, to a certain extent. I mean, like uh, John Lilly ended up being discredited as a scientist largely because of LSD and then ketamine stuff. So there's always this um, almost like tentative relationship between the float community and and psychedelics and and drugs in general which you know by the way the word drugs i think is just so uh loaded and and a yeah. crazy term right like we're drug factories <laughs> like our brains producing our own internal drugs all the time mm-hmm. right endorphin like endogenous morphine like that's what we're doing um yeah but uh <laughs> yeah man no it's a uh, absolutely there's also that sense of inward exploration and and um trying to figure out a little bit more deeply what the human condition is about other than um, just doing things, right? And I love your your difference of like, hey, it's not like I just like doing things. It's like I like doing new things and things that make me a little scared, right? And I think that's also what things like meditation will actually prepare you for. You know, like the, I do this naturally, which I, I found a lot of people don't do, but I have a huge internal monologue uh, going on all the time. Whenever I'm about to do something new, like you said, for preparing for your concert or you bought a concert ticket and you're excited and it's like the third concert you've ever gone to, you know, in your life or whatever, a big one. And like you walk through it so many times in your head, right? And there's this like mental preparation that goes into it. And I think that makes encountering the experience, like that's what we do. We, we dream about things. We pre-plan them when we're nervous. We kind of try to walk through them. Uh, but some people don't do that as much. And I think those are the people who end up playing it a little safer you know it's like everything's a little scarier because they haven't run through all these like plethora of scenarios inside their own head and only through having you know late night porch conversations with friends do i realize that yeah you know not everyone's brain works like that in that kind of preparatory (laughs) way where the challenge and and pre-planning and stuff becomes a game rather than something new is just terrifying until it happens and becomes comfortable Uh yeah I, i hear what you're saying a part of me also appreciates the randomness of anything and that's why i don't plan any of this because i get more out of not knowing what we're going to talk about and we here we are talking about what we're talking about and this is great i could have never planned for it to go this direction and so it's probably frustrating to a lot of people i know and whatever girlfriends i've had and whatever girlfriends i will have that i don't I don't like to plan anything. I like to leave it as as woo woo as it sounds. I like to leave it up to the universe. And um, there's it, to me, it's like a it's like a choose your own adventure, choose your own ending. Is that what the books are called? Choose, choose your own, own adventure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. choose, your, choose own your own ending sounds a little darker, but yeah, choose your own <laughs> adventure is what they're called. Yeah, man, I love those books when I was a kid. And I would go back and I'd read the other options just to see what could happen. But I mean, that's not what life is. Life is the one you chose and then it keeps going and it keeps going. But that's so exciting to me to leave it up to whatever. Like I, I give myself opportunities and, uh, you know, see kind of where it will go. But I don't like to rigidly say, Tomorrow, I'm doing this at four o'clock, and then I'm doing this, I'm doing that. 
I like to just kind of see what happens. And I think, I think that's a, a cool way for me to experience things. At least it's, it's just a different type of, uh, life than I guess some people would choose. And going back to what you were saying with people who maybe are more apprehensive about choices and not uh, investigating different routes that could come about. Sure. And I guess, yeah. So the, like, I also think, so that, that's a perfect tie into kind of the point I was trying to make too, which was the, that idea of, of pre-planning, I think ties into post-analysis really closely as well. You know, so, I mean, with, for instance, psychedelic experiences, there's this idea of then integration, right? Like it, kind of any traditional psychedelic literature you read talks about not only the trip, but then processing that trip and setting aside time to integrate the lessons back into your life and how you're going to uh, take those forward rather than just limit it to the time that you were tripping or whatever, you know? And I think it's true for our daily life. And I think that things like floating um, actually, like if you're really bad at that pre-processing and if doing novel things is scary, I think that floating ahead of time can actually help you set aside time to process that fear a little more in your own mind. And I certainly think that afterwards, uh, not just floating, but meditation, mindfulness practices, anything like that, doing that after you've done a novel experience and trying to figure out what really just happened, you know, replay it. What lessons did I learn? How am I going to take those lessons forward? Even if it's that, hey, I was totally freaked out <laughs> going into this and it ended up being totally fine. Like, that's a good lesson, right? I mean, mm -hmm. I think that's why adults are so much more chill than children. Is like, we've just done more novel things. And like, every new thing is a little bit scary for a kid, for most kids at least. And it's just like, uh, is this going to kill me? And we haven't done enough things yet that haven't killed us where we have that built in, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, so when we're an adult, I think it's it's both easier to approach those things. But then when something really does scare us, it's like, oh, well, I haven't been scared doing something new in a while. Like maybe this one I actually should be scared of. And sometimes you should, right? Like people who do like crazy squirrel suit, suit stunts or you know, <laughs> smashing into mountains and dying yeah. at different times. Like there is that adrenaline rush that borders on the edge of will you really go over it? But so many things, and this is a classic, you know, so many things are less scary, have less consequences are easier to do, and in fact, we're the only ones getting in our own way. Yeah. And if you don't set aside time in your own life to think about that either before or after they happen, then I think it's hard to actually expand your comfort zone, mm -hmm. which also, to your point, I think that that's a worthwhile activity. Like, I, I like to roll dice to make my decisions a lot in life. Really? Yeah. Yeah, I'm a big dice roller. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll like, uh, but yeah, there's, uh, give me an example. What do you, how would you roll it? Did you roll the dice to decide if you're going to come hang out with me? Well, no, no, that was an easy <laughs> one. I'm like, absolutely. <laughs> I don't need to roll dice for this one. Um, <clears throat> yeah, well, so it's, uh, it's kind of like you said, there's so many things to do in life, right? And we didn't get into this thread, but for me, the amount of things that I want to get accomplished in my life, or even that I want to do at any given time is so much greater than the amount of time that I have. Like, I even want to be that guy who just, like, goes on, you know, like, a year-long meditation retreat, but I can't, like, go on a silent meditation retreat for a year and do anything else, right? Like, there's, and I want to be the guy who just, like, lazes around and makes some money and plays video games. Like, there's a part of me that just wants to be a lazy bum and explore that for a while, right? Or, like, go and, yeah, join the Navy and, like, see what that's <laughs> like. Like, there's all these different things that I'd love to do, um, being an architect. And you can't do them all, right? No. So the idea of the dice, I think, is, hey, let's give everything a fair shot. And shout out to uh, The Dice Man, which is a cool book that I read back in the day uh, that, uh, that kind of got me into this philosophy. But uh, since there's so many decisions out there and you can't just time-wise an opportunity cost, you can't choose all of them, how do you decide? And eventually it usually comes down to personal choice and what you're going to put weight on and what you want to do. But then you've made this decision and you've decided, no, all these other things are less important or like, I'm just not going to do them. And I'm, oops, <laughs> hit the mic there, going to focus on this one thing. And so instead, I kind of like rolling dice because I've given everything its fair shot. You know, like I'm like, hey, like, let's say uh, like this one afternoon, I was like, oh, I'm kind of feeling work guilt and I have these things to do and emails I should answer. And I also like want to go tend the garden and do some like cleanup before the winter hits. And I also just want to go out to the poker room and like sling some cards, you know, and then I also want to like call my mom and check in with her. And so I just gave all of those a number and then rolled a dice to see which one I'd actually do. Right. And then everything kind of got its fair chance. Huh. Uh, so I've like treated them all equally. And then the other part of rolling dice is like, I don't like some people like flip a coin and then see how you feel about it and flip it again. And that's how you decide. <laughs> I'm like, no, you roll once. 
you treat that as the thing you wanted to do from the very beginning and you have to go whole like just completely into it like huh. that's you as though that were your decision from the beginning that's what you do yeah but if you get three and it's like fold the laundry are you like oh god no you're like i'm damn ready to fold this laundry <laughs> Yeah, otherwise you don't put it on the list to be like when the sorting the list at the beginning is the important part. Like don't even put anything on there if like it's not something you want to do. Huh. But also, and this goes into what we were just saying, I like to put one thing on there that you don't want to do hmm. or that makes you uncomfortable. Because how- I think it's important to always expand that comfort zone a little bit. Like if it's my day off and I really don't want to work, I'll still oftentimes put like answer a bunch of emails on there and I don't want to do it and I really hope that number doesn't come up. But if it does, I think it's like a good practice in like forcing my brain to just like go into a certain state or like maybe it's something even like, I mean, I, I totally when I was in college uh, did this and rolled dice for whether or not I was going to ask this girl out who I really liked. And it was like, if I roll double sixes and nothing else, <laughs> like that's the one combo that'll be like, I go upstairs right now, like right now and ask her out and it rolled double sixes and I like headed upstairs and had to ask her out, you know? Nice. Yeah. That's There's a the one universe. in 36 chance, right? But yeah, that giving it just even that chance to expand your comfort zone is is kind of cool. And I do think that's important if you want to lead a fulfilling life, you know? That's really cool. I've, I've never heard anybody say that before. How often do you, do you roll dice every day? No, I often forget. Like, I, I usually remember when I feel listless, like, uh, or I have this feeling sometimes where I just have a little free time. And I'm like, I don't even know what I want to do. And like, that's usually when I'll remember <laughs> that I should probably roll dice. But then, yeah, sometimes I get on a streak and for a couple weeks, I'm just like, what dinner do I want to make tonight? And I'm like rolling dice for it. You know, it's almost like finding an old friend again. Yeah. That's pretty cool. I'm going to give that a shot. Oh, I highly recommend it. But yeah, those are my, my two general rules. First of all, never go against what the dice say. If you roll it, you have to do it. Otherwise, mm-hmm. just don't put it on the list. Otherwise, it's not fun. And then the second one, if you can, is, yeah, put something that makes you feel uncomfortable or that you don't want to do. So you have a chance of having to push that, like, desire comfort zone and kind of stretch your uh, either own, like, will or imagination or something like mm-hmm. that, you know? Yeah, I think that stuff is really important. It makes me, I have, I have a good job, a job that I enjoy that I've worked at for, for six years now. I have no desire to, to leave and uh, pursue uh, other things at this point. I'm, I'm things are good. Uh, but I remember a time in my life where I was constantly looking for a job and I dreaded going to interviews. And my confidence level is far higher now than it was before. And when you go into a job interview with low confidence or just like smelling of desperation Uh, and they're like, this guy needs a job. That's the worst. <laughs> and so I feel like I should just interview for a bunch because I don't give a shit. You know, I should just go interview and everywhere. And then we'll just turn them down and be like, never yeah, mind. I no, you guys job. aren't good enough. <laughs> you know, like, because job interviews are so stressful. You're all worried about how you look and what shirt you're wearing, if you said the right thing and do they like me. And when you ha- when you don't care, that's the best way to go in and do it. But I'm just talking about things that make you uncomfortable, you know? Well, in um, that case, it would make you comfortable. So, yeah, that's it's it's so, the yeah. opposite of what you're like. If you feel comfortable with job interviews, that's not what you should be doing to expand your comfort you're zone right. then. Yeah. You're right. Um, but it is true. You no, know, if we're not careful, it contracts too. I think that's the natural human instinct is to contract our comfort zone as we do less and less. And so I think it's, I mean, honestly, just taking walks around your, like, your neighborhood, stuff like that ends up being really important. Just like seeing the outside world and I don't know, maybe that's on my mind just because the pandemic I think got a lot of people very inward centered and not in the sense of floating but like just very self-absorbed and contained in their own little sphere of existence and yeah I think we feel that as humans like we need to remember that the world although it's scary and instinctively we we don't like the unknown because anything that's known is safer than the unknown right for sure we're we're, we're, we're alive and we're not in jail right now as my lawyer says so <laughs> if you if you want to stay that way don't do anything different whenever i'm like hey i had this crazy idea my lawyer's like just don't do it <laughs> you're currently not in jail like the only thing that could change is worse <laughs> you know but like that's the that's why yeah people also need to not all be lawyers you know it's important you to need get a more adventurous that. lawyer <laughs> no, no. I pay him to not be adventurous. That's like, I, it's literally what I pay him for is exactly that. Yeah. He's perfect. Nice. nice. Also, his name is Lee Gill, which is. Yeah. Yeah. So when we need Lee Gill advice. <laughs> nice. Yeah. I won't nice. lie. That was actually part of why we hired our lawyer. Shout out Lee Gill. 
<laughs> He's getting a lot of business. It's too good. It's too good. So what is the what is the general consensus of the people you talk to that go through through your shop and float and uh what what is everybody saying they're getting out of it? What how's it benefiting their lives? Dude, all over the place. Yeah. There's really not a single thing that floating does or benefits people with. Like I almost uh wish there were from a marketing perspective so that I could like market to that specific group of people, but it really is very vast. So, I mean, just to list off a few benefits that people have, and and this came from at some point really early on, I was trying to figure out who our target market is, you know, who is getting the most benefits out of floating. So I, I started just taking out all of our regulars to um, drinks, to dinner, to coffee, um, probably went on like 20 different, uh, you know, just a little like meetups with our most regular customers and members, and they were all over the place. There were like computer programmers who are floating in the middle of the night because we're open 22 hours a day, you know, and uh, coming in because they're night owls and they have insomnia and they can't sleep and their back hurts from programming, you know. We had a dude who's one of our biggest regulars who was in the lumber industry and was basically like just a lumberjack and was trying to spread it among all of his other lumber industry friends because it was so good for his physical body and it was mm -hmm. coming in almost solely for physical reasons. Um, we had like a, like housewife of a doctor who just didn't work her own job. And this was like part of her personal care routine that she did every single week. Um, people who are coming in for fibromyalgia, people who are coming in for like generalized anxiety, people who are coming in for all sorts of things, pregnant ladies coming in floating, <clears throat> excuse me, throughout their pregnancy. Yeah. The range of benefits, both physically and mentally is, is really profound. And I tend to think of it more as. And this is why I said like the float tank's bad at giving you what you want from it and very good at giving you what you need, which is I think when you get in there, like our bodies are actually really built to check in with themselves. You know, it's like you have like uh, tight legs from running too much and it's like, hey, maybe you should take the day off from running tomorrow. You know, like I feel like this is kind of tight and maybe you just like were too overloaded with all your work and other stuff to notice that and you would have, yeah, again, like pulled something the next day if you hadn't realized that, right? Or we had one lady come out of one of her floats and... uh uh, her son had bought it for her, you know, and she came out and she's like, I think I know why my son got this for me. <laughs> like, I, I've just been a bitch to everyone in my life over the last several months. And like, I think I need to stop doing that. <laughs> nice. Know, like, so it's almost like a, like a psychologist, like therapy. Yeah. Yeah. yeah like self-therapy. Anyway. Yeah. Just like forced time out for adults or something, you know, um, hmm. in a certain sense. But again, also like extreme athletes use it for recovery, like weightlifters, um, you know, again, like pro footballers, you know, Tom Brady has one in his house hmm. um, that one of my buddies maintains uh, out on the East Coast. Um yeah, like it's, you know, it, it's all over the place from physical and mental benefits. And it tends to be the places where we just need to throw our attention to make sure we're taking care of ourselves, right? Um, immune system boosting also, like people tend to get sick less often when they're floating regularly. Hmm. Yeah. That's cool. Well, do you guys ever partner with, it seems like OHSU or, I mean, some healthcare facility would want to utilize this. Yeah, and there are some that do. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, and it's it's a little bit mixed, so it's not covered by insurance uh, right now. But there are a lot of, uh, I mean, some of the biggest float studies that have ever come out have come out in the last several years, um, like actual uh, full NIH-sponsored studies and stuff like that. That seems so. insane that, I mean, you can get coverage for acupuncture. That's its own crazy story, don't Yeah, that's interesting. It's Nixon is the reason we have coverage for acupuncture. for Nixon? Insurance. Yeah, yeah. Because he liked it? Oh, yeah, it's its own. Uh, the, the, the short version, just Google this and look it up sometime for the audience. But uh, yeah, basically, he went on a trip over to China and they did a whole surgery that was supposedly the only anesthetic was used was acupuncture. And he came back just being like fully into acupuncture. And that spawned the entire like acupuncture kind of like uh, explosion in the 70s. Wow. Was Nixon basically willing to like fast track a bunch of stuff? Turns out the entire uh, surgery was used definitely like under other like painkillers and yeah. anesthetics. And like it was totally staged to <laughs> impress Nixon basically. Yeah. But blew up the, yeah, blew up. The, I was trying to look into a bunch of histories of alternative medicine to figure <laughs> out what we would do is floating to get insurance coverage at some point. And anyway, yeah, the story of insurance specifically is just such a weird fluke. It was funny, or acupuncture, I mean, is such a weird fluke. It's funny you mentioned that one first, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, I just think about there's all these different uh, fields of care that will help you 
get better. And it, it doesn't make sense to me why that could not be one. Or I mean, I guess there's there's hope for it in the future. For sure, especially as treatment for things like um, generalized anxiety, um, acute anxiety even, uh, things. It's actually proving right now there's a bunch of studies, and this is some of the most recent published stuff coming out, but being um, really good for uh, the deadliest uh, mental disorder, which is anorexia. Uh, nervosa um, has a higher fatality rate than anything else. And floating, it turns out, ends up being um, positive for body image um, over at the uh, library, which is the Laurier Institute for Brain Research, where kind of the biggest premier float research facility is in the U.S. in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, upstairs is a anorexia uh, clinic. And so they have inpatients, they have some outpatients coming in, but they've been able to work with those people for uh, yeah, the past several years and are seeing really positive effects where nothing else, uh, it's one of the hardest to treat disorders as well. Yeah, because that's that's a mental disorder. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And the the act of floating helps them work through it. Yeah. 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 If you look up stuff by Dr. Saib Khalsa, who's currently running the Laureate Institute for Brain Research, um, he also all the float conference um, talks. So we we uh, started this event called the Float Conference some years ago, um, which turned into a big international event. We turned it into a nonprofit um, a few years ago and kind of turned it over to the industry, which is really cool. But all the videos throughout the years are up online. So all these people I'm talking about, Glenn and Lee Perry, um, uh, Lee Perry uh, sadly passed away just uh, just recently, a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, they there's all the videos of them giving talks. There's all Tom, uh, Tom Fine and John Turner, uh, doctors who I talked about. There's uh, videos of them giving talks. But same for uh, Dr. Kalsa talking about his anorexia studies. Uh, both published, and he has some really good presentations up on the Float Conference website, which is just floatconference.com. Again, I have a bunch of stuff for your show notes to cool. toss down there for people Perfect. who actually want to look deeper into this weird yeah. sensory deprivation world. Um, but yeah, lots of him like just actually presenting the data. But yeah, it looks very positive for people with anorexia in addition to all these other things that I was talking about. And I just use that as one example of the broad spectrum of people like Steph Curry floating for better athletic performance too. Girls who are in an anorexia clinic floating to have a better body image, you know, it's all over the place. Yeah, um, it's fascinating stuff. And the reason I see it um, being held back for any reason is just the inability for uh, pharmaceutical companies to make money off of it. I mean... It's interesting. I mean, I will say in general, preventative measure, uh, medicine gets uh, much less attention than acute medicine, at least in our kind of Western, like you said, pharmaceutical yeah, they, driven they world. They want right? you sick so they can prescribe you something and, and generate revenue from it. Yeah, certainly. I mean, I, yeah, I, I'll, I'll let you uh, tackle that side of things. <laughs> yeah. I'm just a humble float tank center yeah. owner over here, you yeah. know? <laughs> yeah. No, it's really cool. But, but it is weird. Like, I, I do think that uh, I like some of the. Uh, Eastern models of medicine practicing where you pay your doctor when you're well, and then you don't pay them when you're sick, but they're required to treat you because hmm. that should like motivate the right incentive, right? Like they get money as long as they're keeping you well. So that's, that's, that's what they, I'll say about that. Where do they do that? Um, there was some like pilot programs. I want to say, I think it was over in Japan. Um, I'd have to look into it again to give so apologies if I got that wrong, but um, wow. yeah, yeah. Paying your doctor when you're healthy. And that was like a decade ago that I was looking into that. So maybe those all crashed and burned and turned out horribly. Yeah. You know, I didn't actually follow up on that one. Yeah. Um, I do like to do a bunch of research. So I'll kind of like dig into things no, and find them. Tell. But I haven't looked into that one in like a decade. So yeah. apologies to you clinics out there if you're doing horribly. But I really truly do feel like that's a better incentive model is making it so that your health and the doctor's pay are aligned rather than uh, the inverse, right? Yeah, no, that's really cool. I've never heard that before. So is there any... Uh, hope or goal to expand and open another shop? Are you going to try to go to a different city? Are you cool with what's happening right now? Yeah, I mean, our own our own journey is a crazy one. Like, I uh, I mean, my, my own personal path is a weird one, too. But, um, you know, for Float On, so we started in 2010. And then, like I said, we kind of realized we just did everything wrong. <laughs> like, and we, our floors were falling apart. Like, our rooms weren't soundproof enough. It was, it was all, like, kind of a disaster. And so we redid everything and we're learning all these lessons and we're figuring out what to do. And at some point it comes down to, and I think we even still own the domains like for Float SF for San Francisco and Float SEA for Seattle. Like we we're going to expand up to Seattle and down to San Francisco. And we were just like, hey, what if we do something totally different and go into supporting the industry instead of opening more float centers? 
So we opened up this consulting branch of what we do called Float Tank Solutions and basically took all the mistakes that we as idiots did and started teaching those to other people and hosting trainings, um, apprenticeships. Um, we started selling a, a template business plan. Um, eventually, over several years, actually made a full like 250-page uh, construction packet for all the construction stuff going into building nice. a float tank center and had it reviewed by like master builders and uh, electricians and all of that stuff, which is where I learned so much about soundproofing, too, was actually having a... Uh, yeah, soundproofing expert review the entire thing and going back and forth over soundproofing for a float tank center specifically. Um, so we did that. And then we started this industry conference. And then we started designing our own software. So actually what you scheduled on is called uh, the Float Helm or Helmbot is the uh, the current company name. But yeah, that's our own software company. So we have probably about um, 500 float tank centers around the world um, who do all of their scheduling and payment processing and stuff through that. Um, and now we branched out into other things like massage and and stuff like that. Um, and then, yeah, started doing book publishing. We have a music uh, publishing company, too. If you go to thetastaterecords.com, um, nice. that's a bunch of, like, float-inspired music from largely Portland local musicians. Um, but, yeah, so we really tried to expand much more into supporting the idea of floating rather than just our own centers. And like you, yeah, have a hard time saying no to an exciting idea, I think. So, yeah, really just kind of branched off in uh, a bunch of different ways like that rather than... Um, franchising or yeah, even internally expanding. That's cool. I mean, the goal, I don't think the goal of life is to make as much money as you can. I think it's to do things that excite you and make you feel good. Sounds like that's what you're doing. Uh, yeah, well, definitely <laughs> doing that. Yeah, I don't know what the goal of life is, but uh, yeah, just kind of winging it <laughs> yeah. over here. I mean, before this, I ran a treasure hunting business. So what does that mean? Um, I designed custom like adventures. For people. So like uh, uh, meetings in dark alleys and cracking codes and hacking into email accounts and car chases and like hopping in helicopters and stuff like that. It would last anywhere from like a few hours to like a few weeks. And I just designed these like totally tailored custom adventures for people was, uh, yeah, the business that I started before, <laughs> before I got sucked into the float Whoa. world. Yeah. Like in like clues in real life or all yeah, digital? Yeah, all, all in real life. Yeah. Well, I mean, some of them were digital, you know, like, yeah, yeah emails and phone numbers and stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's like a, a better version of an escape room. Yeah. Sort of like a real life escape room. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, yeah. And then one day that turned out, I, I was like designing a treasure hunt and I was like, okay, another day at the office, time to go design a treasure hunt. That just depressed me so much. <laughs> I was like, my job is so interesting. And I just felt like it was another day at the office. And I was like, I got to get out of this. Yeah. Um, so then I went to doing about like one a year or something, but I haven't done that in a long time. It's been um, probably over a decade since I've done my, my last treasure hunt. Huh. Yeah, yeah I, I could see how that would be a lot of fun, but I could also see how it would get old. It's so stupid when you're doing something so exciting and you're just like, I'm bored. You're just like, something's wrong. Like, I don't know what's going on here, but this is not the right emotion that I should be feeling for like sending someone up in a helicopter to look for some like clue written out in sand from, yeah. you know, a couple hundred meters up or something. Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I could see, I could see people paying a lot of money for that, you know? Yeah, yeah, right? for sure. It's not a, it's definitely not a bad business if you find the right clients. Yeah. yeah. Huh. That's pretty cool. <laughs> you know what? It's a little earlier than usual, but that was that was point to point to point the entire time. So I think this is a good spot. Cool. Yeah, let's wind it down. Yeah, thanks so much for having me out. This is a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah.